Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, for guests and visitors, my name is Steve Perley, club president, and I'd like to welcome you all to the third meeting of the 47th year of the Rotary Club of Dublin Worthington. Uh, today's invocation and pledge will be offered by the one and only Jerry Katz. <laughs> Now it's on. Yeah. As you bow your heads and prepare your heart to pray to your supreme being, I'd like to remind you of something. Today is July 21st, and it was on this day in 1925, after William Jennings Bryant and Clarence Darrow had rested their cases that John Thomas Scopes was found guilty and fined $100. The so-called Scopes monkey trial was about teaching human evolution. So today we pray to our one of a higher place and be thankful for our lives and for the gifts and talents we have. We know of the destitute and loneliness of some who are suffering from natural disasters. And so we pray for those who have no one to pray for them. We pray for those who need help. We pray that we as Rotarians can be the helpers. And we pray especially today to be thankful that we are on this earth by your miracle and grace. To this, we all say, amen. Yeah. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jerry. Um, now, uh, President-elect Teresa, would you please introduce any visiting Rotarians or any guests we might have? Yeah, Jerry, while you're sitting down, do you have a guest? I do have a guest. I, um, I have a lady who has stuck by me for almost 59 years. Yeah. Which I hope doesn't speak to her intellect, <laughs> as you all know. Uh, but my wife, Mercy Katz. Another guest <laughs> visiting from FC Bank. Hey, I'm going to introduce those folks. John. Um, please stand up. We have a special guest, the president of FC Bank, Jay Saunders, and her colleague, Sheila Hughes. John. And I don't see any other, unless John Gruffy is really here. And then the other one that we can get there, we will feature later. Heather is a guest today with us. We'll be soon. Thank you, Teresa. And um, now our sergeant is again Jerry Katz. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to first apologize to you for uh, what's going to happen uh, with me as sergeant, but first, it's uh, Phil Geisler's fault uh, for putting me on the list as a substitute, uh, as a substitute sergeant, and then it's our speaker's fault today, uh, Alan, because he asked me to sub. <laughs> so the uh, first thing out of the out of the box is uh, we need somebody to carry this uh, pot. And uh, I see an ex-president of our club here who's eating. I always pick on somebody who's still eating. Oh, 
Oh, he's had surgery. Oh, he's had surgery. Here, give me that. Are you sure? No, I'm not going to uh, do that to you, but I am going to charge you for a buck. You got it, Mike. I didn't realize that uh, that it happened. So, uh, happy dollars are first. Who has a happy dollar? Here we go, Alan. Jerry, I will put in three happy dollars just because we finally have 35 years of accumulation of stuff moved out of Hickory Ridge <laughs> and only part of it moved into the new place of the rest. Thank you, VOA, Volunteers of America, and Habitat for Humanity, and everybody else that I gave stuff to and dumped it off. <laughs> it's worth at least $3. Jerry, All right. if, we, if we can, can we get everybody talking to a microphone so that people on Zoom can? Yes, hear? we can do that. More happy dollars, Ann. Um, I have a happy dollar. Um, I honestly don't really understand what it means, but my sister, who just turned fifty this past month, she um, she and her husband did a fourteener. Colorado. I think that means that she climbed 14,000 feet. So that was one of her on her bucket list. So she did that at 11 a.m. on Monday. Wow. Very good. So do a remote people having happy dollars? More happy dollars. Can, can remote people have happy dollars? Yeah, Ted, do you have one? I actually uh, have happy Jen. Uh, before we get to uh, uh, those folks on Zoom for their happy dollars, uh, let me let uh, uh, John uh, take care of the business because I understand these folks need to leave. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I, I, I did a like to our friend Bay. Okay, thank you. And, um, you know, uh, last year we wanted to have a Rotary family picnic, and of course we had to cancel it. And this year, we are on the 4th of July, and this year we wanted to have it on the 4th of July, but we still have another holiday, so we're going to have the Rotary family picnic on Sunday of Labor Day weekend. And FC Bank has again agreed for the second time to be our presenting sponsor. So. <laughs> A mission for Jenny and the bank to be uh, the strongest community bank in the in the Worthington School District, and they're involved in lots of other ways that they support uh, nonprofits and do good in the community. Maybe Jenny will tell you about some of that. Sure. Well, thanks everyone. It's so good to see so many wonderful uh, community members that are leading the charge here today. Uh, you guys are doing amazing work, and. Uh, it's just, it just warms my heart to see everything that you're doing. Uh, FC Bank is corporately headquartered here in Worthington, Ohio. And when I came to the bank, it'll be four years in October, uh, we determined that our mission needed to be that we weren't just located in Worthington, but that we were contributing to the community as a whole. It's very, very important to us. Our core values talk about uh, making sure that our mission and values and beliefs are aligned to the communities that we serve. Uh, it's one thing to just have a business in a community. It's another thing to really contribute and ensure that the things that we're doing in our communities help make the community a better place to be. And you all understand that because you do it every single day. And so when John reached out to me to see whether we would be um, willing to sponsor the family picnic a year or two ago, well, of course, there was no question to it. My family enjoys the family picnic. We all enjoy the family picnic. It is a staple of who we are and what we do as a community. And so um, I, I hope that you'll see and that you've seen that we've We've done what we've said we would do, that we try to contribute as much as we can to various community uh, organizations. And if you haven't had a chance yet to vote for one of our 10 fantastic, or your 10 fantastic charities, 
I know we've got some folks in the room whose organizations are in the finals for that. Uh, keep in mind that that um, is open until August 19th, which is the Friday before the final concert on the green. Uh, you can just go out to our Facebook page or our website, there'll be a link, but there's 10 finalists right now who are in a runoff for the top vote getter gets $3,500, the second place winner gets $2,000, the last or the third place, not last, third place winner gets $1,000, and then the other seven finalists get $500 each for a total of $10,000 back to our community and our nonprofits to help them keep doing all the great work that they're doing as well as you. And so it's just our way to say thank you to the community for everything they're doing. So um, with that, we have a big check that uh, we also gave the small We gave the small check to. <laughs> all right, I'm going to take the mic. right here, Jerry. I'll give you this back. OK, good. And uh, go over a little bit this way. Hey, Jeff, I'm going to go over here too. Jeff was someone who started this about 16 years ago, Joe, with a team from leadership working to you. No, 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 Okay, right. right. you see it? Our college is $5,000 for the Okay, uh, before I go to the Zoom folks, any more happy dollars in the room? Yeah, I guess you guys are all sad, and uh, let me just tell you that uh, for the last year or so, our, our social fund, which is what uh, these fines and uh, happy dollars fund, they've been pretty low, so you might as well get out at least a dollar, because before this is over, you're going to have to contribute. Now, on the Zoom. Any happy dollars on Zoom? Yes, I have one. Okay, go. Hi, this is Ted Inbush. I just want to miss all you guys. Um, I have a happy dollar for the Milwaukee Bucks winning the championship last night. I was a sophomore in high school when they drafted Luel Cinder and they won the championship. So it's been a long time coming. So there's my happy dollar. Okay, thank you. I'm support here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, normally, as a sergeant, I would be giving you the uh, best country and western song titles. Like, if I'd have shot you when I wanted to, I'd be out by now. But I'm not going to do that. I'm giving you, and this is why I apologize, I'm giving you dad jokes. So here we go. Get ready to groan and get ready to put in your dollar. Air used to be free at the gas station. Now it's a buck and a half. You know why? Inflation. There, you groan, you pay. Why is it a bad idea to iron your four leaf clover? Because you shouldn't press your luck. I ordered a chicken and an egg from Amazon. I'll let you know. <laughs> I can't, oh, this is for Alan and, and his lovely wife and their great dogs. I can't take my dog to the pond anymore because the ducks keep attacking him. That's what I get for buying a pure bread dog. <laughs> I didn't want to believe that my dad was stealing from his job as a traffic cop. But when I got home, all the signs were there. 
Um, and so the more variety that you can put into the dog's vocabulary, the more opportunity that you have to find uh, different folks in different scenarios or different situations. So we hide people in the woods, we hide people in barrels buried under rubble, we hide people in closets, we hide people in lots of different places. Uh, and so if you ever come to our house, uh, a lot of you have been there in the past, um, we might ask you to volunteer. <laughs> um, so the, the cadaver dogs that we have are trained to find folks that have passed away or find body fluids or parts of people. So what that means is that we uh, train our dogs with uh, human remains uh, to find different odors. Um, and a lot of people ask the question really frequently of how do you have them generalize that experience so they uh, will find all different stages of decomposition of people and all different uh, ages and age ranges and ethnicities of people. It's the same story as with the live dogs, uh, but we train them to find source that is extremely small. So they will find an ounce of blood all the way up to a person uh, who is deceased. So that capability is uh, challenging to train because you have to expose them to a whole bunch of different odors in a whole bunch of different scenarios uh, so that they start to understand what they're going to get paid for. So all of our dogs work for toys. They want a tug that we have at the end of it. None of them are actually working to find a live or a deceased human. They really want the tug and they 100% believe that that odor is connected to that toy, 100%. And so we do all of our training to teach them that they will get that toy and only that toy when they find the odor. And so all of our dogs work for a tug. They never see this tug unless they do the job that we're paying them for. So they learn within their vocabulary is the way that we put it, um, the different things and the different odors that they have been paid for in the past, and they will generalize. So much the same way that we generalize circumstances and we understand things, even if we haven't been put in that exact circumstance, our dogs will learn to do the same thing. So it's pretty remarkable because most people think of their dog as like, I've taught my dog to sit, my dog sits. Well, your dog may only actually sit at home unless you have taught your dog to sit at Home Depot, sit in the park, sit when strangers are there, sit when people are around. So that your dog understands the concept of sit in all of those different scenarios and then can generalize when my owner says sit, I sit. Regardless of what's going on around me, regardless of the people and the noise and the scenario and all of that sort of thing. Until you teach them to generalize that, they don't understand it. The same concept applies to what we teach them with odor. So we teach them to generalize the odors that they're smelling and they learn to, to test a bit on whether they get paid or not paid for the odor that they're smelling. And so we have to proof them off of things. Um, there's a perfect example. My dog had the opportunity to be in a circumstance where there was no actual decomp odor, but he was in the presence of, consider it similar to somebody's hockey bag. And the hockey equipment had not been washed for a long <laughs> period of time. A lot of you are laughing, so you know how bad that smells. It does, in fact, smell like uh, decomposing human cells to some extent, but I don't want him to bark and tell me that somebody is dead in a hockey bag, right? Unless they are. Unless they are. So I have to teach him not to bark at the hockey bag and instead to bark at actual decomp of human tissue. So. Um, we teach the dogs all of these different parameters, and then we ask them to generalize. And so in those circumstances, um, you know, we, we have material, we train with different folks material. Um, we take donations of all types of human remains or human tissue from decomp. People who have teeth surgeries, people who have their hips removed or replaced or their knees uh, removed or replaced. Those tissues are samples that allow us to train the dogs what decomposition is so that they can use that to find. Um, Not that anybody here will get a name you have for a knee replaced, but. Or your teeth cold. When that happens, feel free to ask to save it for us. <laughs> we'll take donations. Um, we also get the, the opportunity to train um, on materials that for people who have donated their bodies to science. So as an example, Wright State has a program 
where you can donate your body when you die. Um, and then it is used for a variety of medical training procedures as well as being used for our training purposes. The reason that this is important, and a lot of people go, oh, this is gross, like, why are you telling me this? The reason this is important is because it allows us the ability to train for circumstances where we need to be able to find somebody or their families that has gone missing. So it is a very important service that we provide. It's very difficult. It's all volunteer. Um, and we are called to a number of different scenarios for, for that work. Um, so all joking aside, if you do have tissue, we'll take it. Um, other than that, uh, do you want to do, you want to go get back and we can do a demo and I'll chat about how we do engagement. And, uh, so the first thing that uh, we teach our dogs. If I can just say something. He's going to come in here. I'll give him a few minutes. Uh, I'll just <laughs> so, uh, we teach our dogs to engage with us, um, and so in these circumstances, you can go fetch him. In these circumstances, um, <laughs> we want the dogs to pay 100% attention. <laughs> He's well trained too. <laughs> That's not really fair. Um, so, the, uh, the, we train our dogs to engage with us. So, we want to take them into all different circumstances, and I want them to be neutral to people. So I want them to not pay attention to any of you and think that I'm the most important thing and they're working for that reward in the room. So that being said, Alan's gonna grab Maverick. Maverick's gonna come in here. Even if Maverick comes up to you, don't look at him, don't pet him, don't reach out for him, don't try and touch him. Because we have taught Maverick that we will protect Maverick and that people will not touch him unless we give them permission to touch him and that he will not have to worry about people reaching out to touch him if he's in a circumstance like this. So we need all of your help to not touch Maverick, even if he comes by you. So Melon will probably start him over here. He is going to search for some human remains in this room to show you what that looks like that we've hidden. Um, but again, even if he runs by you, please don't reach for him, please don't touch him, please don't pet him. Even if he's looking at you, just completely ignore him. Um, and the reason that we do that is because I want to be able to take the dog into any sort of circumstance where there are people um, and the people are hanging out, milling, standing, doing whatever they're doing, and he won't pay attention to them or anything else because I want him to focus on the task at hand. And so a lot of people will take our dogs into public and a lot of people ask to pet them. And you know what my answer always is? No. I don't care how cute your kid is. I don't care how but you want to pet my dog? The answer is still no. And the reason for that is because I have told Maverick and I've told Melvin and I've told Scrappy and all of our dogs, you don't have to worry about people touching you in these circumstances because I need you to focus on me. And the only way I can get that is if they stop worrying about people and they're neutral to them. So that leads into another just public service announcement. When you're out in public, if somebody is working with their dog and they'll bring their dog up to you and let their dog come to you and want it to be pet, still ask to pet the dog. Don't reach out and try and pet the dog. And don't let your kids or grandchildren or those sorts of things walk up and run screaming towards dogs because it's not safe for them, one. And two, because it's not safe for the dog necessarily either because the dog may be trained like ours to ignore people. And if somebody comes running at them, they may get pretty worried because we told them that that's not gonna happen. So um, just make sure that when you're out in public and people have dogs, regardless of the dog, any dog is capable, at the end of the day, any dog is capable of fighting. Um, and though they are our pets and they are our friends and they are our family members, do remember that they are still dogs. Um, no, I hear him. Yeah, I hear him. So here comes Maverick. Uh, so Maverick is a Belgian Malinois. He is my buddy. He is two uh, and a two and a half years old, um, and he is pure friend. Um, so he came out of a kennel in Connecticut, uh, and he has been training to find human remains since he was about six months old. Um, and he was certified last November to find uh, human remains both on land, uh, in the wilderness, in cars buried. Um, and he will find both skeletal and, um, and tissue remains. He was also trained to find human remains in water. So on his test, he, there was remains 40 feet in the 
water. Wind was blowing like crazy on a lake, and he was able to identify properly where those human remains are. So a lot of people doubt the ability of the dog to be able to do that, but the most uh, useful purpose for these dogs is to pinpoint exactly where the odor is, whether that be in a recovery situation in rubble, where you're going to ask, you're going to need to dig to find the remains of people, or that be in a lake and you don't know where to send the sonar or the divers or people, this allows people to narrow down those search parameters. So we always work at the request of an agency, whether that be a governmental agency or a law enforcement body, we don't work independently, um, but we work within one of those agencies. Maverick, ready to do his job? He looks ready. Okay, remember, don't touch him, don't look at him. Even if he comes to you, we'll let him do his job. He's gonna go to that side of the room, so we're gonna let him go here. We're gonna ask him to search and he's gonna go that way, just so everybody's sort of aware of where he's headed. Um, and? I hope he does. Is, afraid of <laughs> Is anybody afraid of dogs that? Okay, I'll stand by you. George Norris is so Maverick is going to get very excited about working. He's going to jump all over Alan, which most people go, I don't want my dog to jump on me. Uh, we want our dogs to get this excited about working because this is what turns the drive on for them to hunt. So Maverick thinks this whole room smells like human remains, even if you can't smell it. I promise you, he can smell it sitting over where he was. So he's now got his nose right where the source is, and if you can't see him, he's sitting right behind the podium. And Alan is going to reward him by giving him his tug. Yes. Yeah. So he, I guess we should turn the podium around, but he sits as his indication, and he will stick his nose into some place, he'll wag his tail, and then he'll put his butt straight on the ground. And look at Alan and say, I found it. Uh, so Melvin is the other human remains dog that we have. He has a bark alert, um, and so he's got what we call an active alert. Maverick has what we call a passive alert, which is the, the sitting. So what questions do you have? What happens if there's no, uh, if he doesn't find, if there isn't any smell that he gets Yeah, so I'll use Melvin as an example. If Melvin goes, if I were to release Melvin in this room, he probably would start by barking and then he'd run around a bit, bark, and then he'd find the odor and he'd bark at the same place that Maverick sat. If there's no odor, Melvin would go out to a tour and come back and look at me and be like, there's nothing here, dummy. <laughs> so did he get more reward? So he gets a different reward. So the tug is the reward that he gets only when he finds human remains, but he does have to work for a ball as well. So he does all of his obedience work for a ball and anything outside of finding human remains, he gets a ball. So if he goes out and does work, I pay him for his work by giving him the ball. Once we clear the space and we walk away so that we're not rewarding any specific uh, circumstance, but he's learned that he only gets that tug when he sees, when he finds human remains. Does it come just permanently, or at some point you kind of... He, he gives it up. Uh -huh. He gives it up. He gives it up when he gets to the van. He gives it up when he gets to the van. So, like, we let them carry it around, like, Maverick's probably still holding on, because we let them carry it around, because it's sort of like, I, so the, the idea is, right, we activate their prey drive, which is why Alan asked if we're ready to search. He got all excited, he jumped all over Alan, so we said, basically, are you ready to hunt? We told him to go hunt, which is their hunt drive. So he's hunting for the odor. He finds the odor. And then in normal dog behavior, when they find something, right? If they were hunting for their food, they would kill it. And then they would share it with you. And so that's, we're activating that same string of behaviors in their searching. And so they go from prey to hunt. And then once they find it, they get the tug, they kill the tug, right? So they blah, 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 shake it, tug with you, play with you. And then they share it with you in that they're willing to give it up and give it to you to, to say, okay, I'll share with you now. So we activate that same string of behaviors. 
Yeah. Heather, could you tell us more about your involvement and connection to this whole thing? Uh, is this you or is this an organization that you work for or? Uh, so I, I personally am, uh, so I'm on Ohio Task Force as a canine search specialist. Uh, so I have two canines certified to that. It's Melvin and Scrappy. Scrappy is my live find dog. Melvin is my um, HR dog. Uh, but both of our dogs are also certified through APCA, which is the American Police Canine Association. So though Maverick, the one that you just saw, and Melvin are also certified through that. We work with a local group um, called Midwest Canine, and we are also on Kentucky Search Dog Association. So we, we regularly go to Kentucky to search. What breed or breeds are best in this? Great question. So there are a number of different breeds um, that are used. Most, sorry, I just tried to repeat my question, his question. So the, the question was what breeds are being used or are the most frequently or best at this job? Um, so the, the breeds that are commonly used are those that work most independently, right? So we have to be able to send the dog away. Uh, it has to be willing to go away. Uh, why did you bring Honey, Melvin in? I shrunk the dog. <laughs> oh, Alan brought it in funny. Um, so we, uh, um, the breeds that are best at this, um, are the ones that will work independently. They work for a reward and they have enough drive. So with that, the most common dogs that are used are field bred dogs. So for dogs that are bred for hunting, labs, golden retrievers, even some Springer Spaniels or those sorts of things can do the work or border collies because they have a high enough, intense enough drive to hunt and do the work. Um, and then Belgian Malinois and German Shepherds are used. The most agile, most intense dogs that do the work the longest from a FEMA situation in a rubble circumstance are generally Belgian Malinois. Um, because they have a different level of intensity that they bring to the game than the rest of those breeds do. Um, so they will work longer and harder because they're a harder dog than some of the other dogs that are a little bit softer in their mentality. So, uh, but anything that meets those requirements can really do the work. Yeah. How long does it take to train the dog? Yeah, great question. So Maverick started when he was six months and he certified when he was just over 18 months old. Um, and so it takes, so there's, there's a couple of components that go into it. And the first is the hunting and searching that we talked about. The other one is obedience. So all of these dogs have to be obedient off leash for you to be able to release them into the field to go search and have them come back to you a hundred percent reliably. So there's the, those two components are taught pretty independently until pretty late in the game when you may combine like the sit with the search pattern, um, in the behavior that they're doing, because that's his trained final response. So some dogs, uh, you know, the more intense ones, the ones that are quicker and faster learning can take less time. Melvin had all of his obedience and I put the HR portion on it on him in about six months. And he certified within six months of the training him for the odor. Um, so it's really those two components. But if you're starting with a puppy, like the one that Alan has over here, she's six months old. She can't certify until she's 18 months, and she won't be ready to certify until she's between 18 months and two years old. Yes. How did you get into this? Great question. Um, so, yeah, I, um, I, I have had an interest. So I, I have volunteered my time in a number of different organizations for most of my life. Um, and have been in emergency services more recently. Um, you know, I was in ski patrol and then we were in the fire department um, and I've been involved in that sort of thing. And I've always had a really intense interest in dogs and training dogs. Um, I grew up riding and training horses. Um, and so the behavioral component and that sort of thing has transferred really pretty seamlessly to, uh, to training dogs. Alan uh, has always wanted to have a search and rescue dog and he's always wanted a Belgian Malinois. And uh, about four years ago, he found a litter of puppies uh, that were available and said, I want to get a Belgian Malinois. We got said Belgian Malinois, his name is Melvin. And about a week into having Melvin, Alan was like, this dog is terrible. <laughs> they are not pets. They make terrible pets, in fact, uh, because they like to work constantly. They like to be doing something. They're busy there. And if you're not training them, they train you. So uh, I pretty much took over training Melvin and we did a bunch of different obedience based stuff and then really 
honed his search and rescue and then moved him down that path. Um, it also takes a long time to get on the Ohio task force uh, and be able to get your dog to be FEMA certified. And so sort of in parallel, I was working on that path while I was training Melvin to get to that certification point. So it, it takes a while to get there, but that's where the interest came from. Yes. Did, did you get a request to go to the certified? Yes. So I was deployed with the Ohio Task Force as a canine search specialist, and I took both my live find dog and my HRD dog uh, to Surfside and was there as activated. So we were um, alerted that we were going to go on June 25th. We were activated on June 30th, and I returned home on the 15th of July. That was my It's too raw to talk about that experience. It is. It is. What other questions? How do you know when it is a dog always trick? I mean, it's kind of like you said there's certain breeds that are good for it. Yeah. And then what happens maybe when do you know the dog is not going to do it? Or is that the trainer? Is the trainer not the dog? That's a, it's a great question. Um you can for live find dogs, they're actually less live find capable dogs that are prepared to do the FEMA system from a search and rescue perspective than it is from an HR perspective. And the reason for that is because you not only have to have that string of behaviors that I talked about, have an intense enough dog and all of those sorts of things, but you have to have a dog that does have some basic <coughs> desire to spend time playing with other people because they have to want to find strangers. And a lot of these dogs that are this intense, this driven, this wanting to work are less caring about playing with other people and strangers and that sort of thing and they tend to have a little bit more stranger danger um and so it's a little bit harder to find a dog that will do all this stuff pay attention to you work for you but still go find and want to play with strangers um at an intense enough level and so um you can tell pretty quickly so melvin at one point started out as a live find dog um and he is a very high drag dog like maverick uh even more so and he would go and send him out on the pile to, to do, um, to search, and he would lose his drive. He'd just turn off because he had no interest in playing with other people. It wasn't a reward to him. So he didn't find it fun. He didn't like the game. And so as soon as they don't like the game, they're done. Like, they can't do it. So we swapped, and he really likes the game when he gets the reward from me, and he gets to play with me. So now you can send him on the pile, he turns on, and he will search until his until you turn him off for HR odor because he knows that the reward comes from me and he only has to play with me and he's comfortable with that. So um, it, it's different for different dogs. Some just don't have enough drive. They're too soft. They don't have the desire to do the work um, or they don't have the, the intensity to do the work. Which is why this is the third dog question go ahead Ted do you get compensated for this when you get deployed great question so we are compensated only on deployment so from the time we are officially activated to the time that we pull back in the warehouse and are demobilized we are paid 24 hours a day other than that there is no reimbursement for the work that we do and who, com who compensates you whoever whoever asks for your deployment you do so it's the federal government uh, compensates us because we are a FEMA task force. Gotcha. So Thank you. It's one of 28 task forces in the, in the country that are uh, FEMA teams. So they can be a national resource and be deployed as a national resource. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Alan and Heather, thank you very much for presenting today. Thank you. Uh, next
next week's speaker will be Travis Gulling, uh, executive director of A Kid Again, and he's going to tell us about their organization and how they make life normal again for families caring for a child with life threatening conditions. Um, but before we wrap up today, we do have a raffle, right, Bonnie? Yeah. Let's get you a microphone. <laughs> All right, is there to go? It's thirteen dollars in today's raffle, and the number is three four six two five zero. Wow! Go, Alan. Alan, right here. Alan, get your money back. How much was it? Pays to contribute. Yeah. All right. All right. Do we have an ace of spades this week? Fine. Yeah. Do we have an ace of spades this week? Yes, again. Oh. Because she's not using the microphone like I asked. I don't have to touch the hand. Here's the new deck of cards. Do I do something with this? Yes, yeah, spread them out or something. All right. <laughs> Part of presidential training you didn't know about. Learn stuff every week. Probably should shut that. It's right on the bottom. It's right on the bottom. It was on the bottom. Yeah, yeah, they're real. This number is 346232. Hey. While we're waiting, I'll put mine back in the in the kitty for the foundation. Is that what we want, Jerry? Yeah, so I hand it to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send a receipt. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Faith. All right. And then finally, if you'll join me in the four weight tests. Maybe if I can get it pulled up. Of the things we think, say, and do. First, this is, this is the truth. Second, this is fair. fair for all concerned. Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, will it be beneficial to all, to all concerned? Thank you, everyone. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.